So we're going to go ahead and begin the exam four review. This is part one. We will be discussing the renal and GI systems first. Uh, then you will see under announcements, I'm going to do a second part, uh, which will of course be the GI, um, the reproductive and the GI systems. So let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about the renal system. So the good thing about the renal system is we're pulling through a lot of the concepts that you've already learned throughout the course. For example, we talked about target organ disease related to hypertension, and we know that hypertension really hits those kidneys hard and can even um, cause chronic renal failure. So some of those concepts, um, such as the Ross system, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, uh, we talked about diabetes insipidus, and we talked about uh, the neural system. So those will certainly be good foundations as we move through some of the important pathological disorders of the renal system. So first, let's talk about acute unilateral, unilateral renal obstruction and hypertension. So some of the most common causes of obstruction is certainly kidney stones, renal stones, extremely, extremely painful. And you can see why when you look at the PowerPoint, you can see those stones there in the corner and they're very jagged and extremely painful. Probably one of the most painful things a patient can go through. But one of the most common types of renal stones or kidney stones is uh, calcium oxalate. So passage of those kidney stones through the ureter, through the urethra, um, a lot of times it's, like I said, very painful, but we, we call that pain referred pain. Referred pain and it's to the umbilicus. The reason is because of what happens is the ureter actually rises from that 10th thoracic nerve root. Thus, they feel that pain around the umbilicus. Also, we know that uh, an obstruction is going to decrease perfusion, right? And so perfusion to the kidney because of that obstruction is going to block that ability for good blood flow. And so we know what happens when those kidney senses any kind of decreased perfusion for whatever reason, and we know that the kidneys expect 20 to 25 percent of their um, of that of that blood flow. So because of that obstruction, for whatever reason, in this case, let's talk about kidney stones. What ends up happening is they sense that decreased perfusion, and of course, it's going to activate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system causing that constriction of those peripheral arterioles, and therefore we have hypertension. So urinary tract infections, clinical manifestations of a urinary tract infection are vague, um, sometimes frequency in urination, sometimes the patient will complain of blood in the urine, uh, but for the older adult, it can be even more challenging. Uh, one of the symptoms can be confusion. A lot of time in the emergency room uh, clinics, a caregiver will come in and say their older relative has become somewhat confused. A lot of times the first thing we're going to do is a urinalysis and determine is there WBCs in the urinalysis. And then of course would come the urine culture. Something else is called polyonephritis. Polyonephritis, <clears throat> excuse me, is an infection of one or both upper urinary tracts, ureter, renal pelvis, kidney, interstitium. But urinary obstruction and a reflux of urine from the bladder are the most common underlying risk factors. And of course, some of the culprits are, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, is E. coli. Of course, that's because of the proximity of that urinary tract to the rectum, right? So E. coli is a big problem. Also, proteus and pseudomonas. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about um, polyonephritis is that they will have, <clears throat> excuse me, white blood cells cast in their urinalysis. Now, and that's not always going to happen, but whenever you see white blood cell casts, you really think there's something going on in that renal system because that's the only place they're formed. In fact, the only place they're formed is actually in the tubules. So that gives you a heads up that you really need to differentiate what's going on in that renal tract. 
So let's go to painful bladder syndrome or what's referred to as interstitial cystitis. So PBS on IC is something that really mimics a urinary tract infection, but it is really related to non-bacterial infection. So things like virus, uh, chlamydia, fungal. Also, non-infectious cystitis can be caused from radiation, uh, some kind of chemicals, auto could also be an autoimmune disease, but really the cause is unknown. These are the people that you really need to start wondering. They come in with the signs and sy symptoms of a bladder infection, and you've done multiple rounds of antibiotics. You may want to think about possibly looking into interstitial cystitis instead. So differentiating the symptoms of cystitis from those of polynephritis, of course, clinical assessment alone can be difficult, but the specific diagnosis is certainly through a urine culture. We start with that urinalysis. So in that urinalysis, like I said, you're going to see those white blood cells and particularly those white blood cell casts. Not all the time will you see the casts but you will probably certainly see those white blood cells. And that's gonna move you into doing a urine culture. So now glomerular disorders, now you're gonna see the red blood cell casts. So whenever we see red blood cell casts in a urinalysis, you're gonna start thinking about what's going on with that glomerulus. <laughs> so reduced GFR, glomerular filtration rate during glomerular disease. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time saying that today. Disease is evidenced by elevated plasma urea, creatinine concentration, or reduced renal creatinine clearance. And so the kidneys are unable to clear that urea from the body, right? And so you're going to see an increased serum, but you're going to see decrease creatinine in the urine. So acute glomerular nephritis includes renal diseases in which glomerular infl inflammation is caused by immune mechanisms. It can also be caused by toxins. It can be caused by drugs. Um, but most of the time, it's some sort of immune mechanism. So the symptoms are usually hematuria and proteinuria, much, much milder, though, than nephrotic syndrome, which we're going to talk about nephrotic syndrome all by itself here in a minute. And in more severe cases, these symptoms are also accompanied by edema, hypertension, and impaired renal function. So we know that the primary um, acute glomerular nephritis is usually toxins, drugs, or an immunological problem. But what happens is there is going to be proteinuria. So when you think about proteinuria, not as bad as nephrotic syndrome, but you're still going to have that loss of protein. So when you look down here in the corner of the slide, you see that glomeruli. Glomeruli are, look at how tight those junctions are. There's a reason for that. That's because they filter the good stuff. They want to keep the good stuff. One of the good stuff is protein, right? Protein is huge, right? So it has no business getting through that filtration. But because it's damaged, the protein begins to leak through and come out in the urine. So that's why a simple urinalysis can tell us a lot about how those kidneys are functioning. So let's move to nephrotic syndrome. So nephrotic syndrome, on the other hand, is different than acute glomerular nephritis in that with nephrotic syndrome, there is massive protein urea. So protein urea, we're talking about an excretion of three grams or more of protein. So what you're going to see is even more marked peripheral edema. This peripheral edema is because Serum proteins are decreased. It's being lost in the urine. And so we know how important protein is with water balance, fluid water balance in the body. And so the fluid is not able to stay where it's supposed to, and it ends up causing that edema. So you see that, that beautiful little algorithm here that comes directly from your textbook. You can see where that glomerular permeability, it loses that plasma proteins and proteinuria, resulting in hypoalbuminemia, decreased albumin in the blood, in other words. And what you're going to see is that decreased plasma volume and once again, ADH and A 
and aldosterone are going to be secreted. But what ends up happening is that retention of sodium and, of course, water retention. And what do you get? You get edema. Here's some other things that go on. Um, over here, you also have lipiduria and hyperlipoproteinemia. Nephrotic syndrome, uh, just real quick, is also can be caused by lupus. We know lupus really, really hits the kidneys hard. And so sometimes you'll see these patients with nephrotic syndrome. So this is a secondary form of nephrotic syndrome. So let's talk about acute kidney injury. So acute kidney injury, it can be acute and it can be um, actually progressed pretty quickly. So that's one reason why we always watch mean arterial pressure. So we want to keep that mean arterial pressure above around 60 or 65, which can be simply uh, monitored with a blood pressure, right? And so we want to make sure that we're not killing kidneys. So that's why we watch those blood pressures and monitor them so closely with our patients. Um, and so there's something called pre-renal acute kidney injury. That's just when we talked about, remember, heart failure. And so all it means is pre, above, before. That's the way I remember it. But when we talk about intra-renal, we think more about exposure to, let's say, radio contrast media. So a patient goes down for a CAT scan. That's why we really monitor their fluid intake and output after these different um, diagnostics that need this contrast dye because it has the potential to kill the kidney. So what we do when we're actually watching a patient's kidney, the best best way to monitor is something called glomerular filtration rate, GFR. GFR is readily available on any urinalysis, okay? Very cheap, very cheap way to monitor that. So we know that kidney failure can also progress to a chronic stage, but we the good news is with acute kidney failure, it can be reversed. So we watch levels of serum creatinine and urea, which of course are gonna be elevated. However, you've got to remember changes in serum creatinine level occur only if more than 50% of the glomerular filtration is actually lost. And this can actually be delayed. So when you're doing your lab values, it can take up to 24 hours for that to be noticed on a lab value because it takes that long for the body to recognize that. So some of the other things about acute kidney injury is that we know that the kidneys are the main excretory organ for some of our electrolytes. Yes, we're going back to exam one. Um, but potassium, we know that it is mainly excreted in the kidneys. We know some of it is excreted via the bowel, but mainly those kidneys. So when those kidneys aren't working very well, the body's gonna hang on to potassium. So you're gonna see hyperkalemia with these patients also phosphorus, remember phosphorus or phosphate, you can pronounce it either way, that's another one that expects those kidneys to excrete it. When the kidneys aren't working, hmm, hang on to that phosphorus and you're gonna see that hyperphosphatemia with the resultant hypocalcemia, right? So not enough calcium because those are reciprocal. So that is some of the hallmark signs that you're gonna see with acute kidney failure. You're also going to see some metabolic acidosis, depending on the severity of the renal failure or the injury. Um, but remember, it's the, the kidneys have an incredible role in acid-base balance. And so you're going to see an increase in maybe hydrogen, decreased potassium level and hydrogen excretion. So you're going to see that metabolic acidosis as well. So let's go ahead and move on to gastrointestinal system. And we're, of course, going to start with GERD. I'm sure you're very familiar with this. There's lots and lots of medications out there now, uh, lots of commercials on the different types of medication for GERD. So it is gastroesophageal reflux disease. And it's a reflux of the acid and pepsid from the stomach back into the esophagus. And remember, the stomach is structured to withstand a pH of 2.0, right? That's hydrochloric acid, but the esophagus isn't. And so it's literally acid 
of a pH of two going into that esophagus. So over time, it can be eroded. It can cause um, a lot of a lot of damage to that esophagus. And so, of course, we're going to treat those patients with medications. Um, and there's also other things they can do, such as some of the risk factors are obesity. So we want to try and get them to lose that weight. The other thing is a risk factor is smoking. So nicotine can cause that loosening of the LES, which is that lower esophageal sphincter. And so um, medications, anticholinergics, uh, calcium channel blockers, those can cause that reflux disease as well. Also, we know that GERD uh, can trigger an asthma attack and of course that chronic cough. So those clinical manifestations, they're pretty simple. Heartburn, all right, very, can, be, can be very painful. Sometimes a patient will come in complaining of chest pain. Of course, you're going to rule out any cardiac event, but it can be just how bad that pain, <laughs> excuse me, the pain of GERD has gotten. It can also worsen if they lie down, which makes sense. That's going to increase intra-abdominal pressure. Um, and so certainly we want to hopefully tell them not to lie down, usually at least one hour after eating. So next we're going to talk about bowel obstruction. So bowel obstructions, um, the most common cause in the small intestines is adhesions. So there's a real pretty picture down there of adhesions. I hope you're not eating right now. But anyway, it uh, certainly, you'll remember that if that's a question. But adhesions are one of the big culprits. So you definitely want to get that history and find out how many of maybe abdominal surgeries patients have had. And so you, it can certainly be um, a huge risk factor when you're talking about a bowel obstruction. So um, about 50 to 75% are caused by those. So small bowel obstructions, they usually present early with abdominal distension. That's why we're always looking at that abdomen, listening to those bowel sounds and so on. If the obstruction is high at the pylorus or high in the small intestines, initially, initially, metabolic alkalosis will develop. That's a result of those excessive loss of hydrogen ions that usually are reabsorbed, correct? Well, but as it begins to be prolonged, what ends up happening is that intestinal obstruction that's causing a lack of circulation, all that pressure. So those good nutrients and blood flow are now blocked. Well, remember when that circulation is blocked, our body runs on aerobic metabolism, but now it's going to have to switch to anaerobic metabolism. And we know the byproduct of anaerobic metabolism is lactic acid. So what ends up happening is now lactic acid is being pumped out and the patient will now move into a metabolic acidosis state. So real quick right here down on the slide, <clears throat> excuse me, you see a couple other types of bowel obstructions. The one over there with the green arrow, that's called intersusception. And what that is, is a telescoping of the bowel. We see that a lot in our pediatric patients, not so much in adults. And then on the other side, you see something called a volvulus. That just means a twisting of the bowel. So those are structural, structural types of causes of, of obstruction in the bowel. Functional is what we're familiar with is called paralytic ileus. That's where there's nothing there. There's nothing obstructing it. There's not a tumor. There's not adhesions. It's where when the bowel, for whatever reason, usually related to post-op, right? Because we know anesthesia, it causes that bowel to go into sort of a, a, a state of where it can't cause the peristalsis and not sure why that happens, um, for pretty well drug-related. And so that's a functional. There's nothing there blocking it. And that usually resolves on itself. So here's a really good depiction or an algorithm of what happens with intestinal obstruction. You can see as you move down, this comes from your textbook, but I know some people really like to see pictures. And you can see, look at that distension right there. That's going to be that first sign. And then you can move through and you can see all the complications that can happen. Even on this side, you see alkalosis is somewhat of an early sign. And then later on, 
I've already explained how that metabolic acidosis happens. So peptic ulcer disease. So a peptic ulcer is a break or an ulceration in a protective mucosal lining of that lower esophagus, stomach, or duodenum. So you can see from this picture, those ulcers can happen anywhere, any way throughout, even up in the esophagus. And so the risk factors, we know there's a genetic predisposition, but H. pylori is the big problem, all right? So H. pylori, infection of the gastric mucosa. One of the causes of um, an increased risk for H. pylori setting up shop in the stomach or the duodenum, particularly in the stomach, is because uh, the habitual use of NSAIDs. NSAIDs are what we call ibuprofen, right? So ibuprofen, they're great uh, for pain because they actually decrease the synthesis of prostaglandin. Well, prostaglandin, that's all great and good, but it results in decreased bicarbonate secretion and mucin. Mucin is that component of the gut that has that protective barrier against hydrochloric acid. So without that, that hydrochloric acid, which is a pH of around two, it begins to erode that gastric, the stomach, that, that gastric lining. And so if that's eroded, and you can see here on the slide, see that little H. pylori, see how it's gonna burrow in there because there's no more protection which is burrows in there and sets up shop. So sometimes because of peptic ulcer disease, it can be that bad, um, uh, gastric cancer, sometimes uh, the patient has to undergo a partial gastrectomy or sometimes a total gastrectomy. And so the clinical manifestations, what happens afterwards is when that stomach even partially is removed or completely removed in some cases, as you can see from this diagram here on the slide, what ends up happening is the reservoir, the stomach, is now gone. And that reservoir, the stomach, is very important. Some really important things go on in that stomach, right? Because I know you've read the physiology of the stomach and how important that is for some of that digestion of those foods. But because of that missing, that bolus is what I call it, it doesn't go gently into those small intestines, it's a big bolus that goes into the small intestine causing that sudden shift of fluid. So dumping syndrome occurs when the contents of the stomach empties way too quickly into the small intestines. The partially digested food draws excess fluid into those small intestines, causing those signs and symptoms. A lot of times it's nausea, cramping, but sometimes it can be as severe as fainting and palpitations. And so when patients, um, <clears throat> we teach our patients that a lot of times it'll resolve on its own or at least get better. But at first we want to make sure they're eating small frequent meals no fluids during meals, and high protein and low carb diet. The next, we're, next thing we're gonna discuss is of course, Crohn's disease compared to ulcerative colitis. So these two are under the umbrella of inflammatory bowel disease, not to be confused with irritable bowel syndrome. So inflammatory bowel disease, disease has two categories. Like I said, so ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's disease. And this is a really nice table for you. And of course, it's in the review notes for you as well. But age of onset, usually not a lot of difference. You can see 10 to 40 for UC and 10 to 30 for Crohn's. What's important is that family history. You see that ulcerative colitis is much less common, but with Crohn's, it's much more common. Now comes the patho. When you think about ulcerative colitis, you see that the mucosal layer is involved. So sort of more superficial versus Crohn's disease, it's the entire intestinal wall. Fistula and abscesses are rare, but with, Crohn, uh, with Crohn's disease, it's very common. The other thing about the lesions with Crohn's disease is that we call them skipped lesions because Crohn's disease can affect the entire GI tract versus ulcerative colitis pretty well just stays in that sigmoid colon and the rectum.
Um, so abdominal pain, yeah, occasionally. Diarrhea is common with both. And so the big take home question, the big take home message here, of course, is that idea of those skipped lesions with Crohn's disease and that it goes through the full thickness. Um, so really, really a very debilitating, can be a very debilitating disease. But let's talk about liver. We all love the liver, come on. We know it has something like 13 or 14 function. It just kind of depends on which physiology book that you read. But we do know that most of those functions can be taken over by other systems in the body. But there's one that can't, and that is the synthesis of amino acids and the putting together and tearing down of proteins, right? So, so that's why we die if we don't have a liver. Um, any condition that disrupts the normal functioning of the liver, thus hepato hepatocyte dysfunction can cause hypoalbuminemia. And once again, go back to exam one. Think about how important protein is in our body. So first, let's talk about cirrhosis. Cirrhosis, um, it is an irreversible inflammatory fibrotic liver disease. So when you look at that picture, that's a real pretty healthy liver up there. And then look right next to it. That's a fibrotic liver. So you can see where that chaotic fibrosis alters or obstructs biliary channels and blood flow. So it's gonna produce jaundice and something called portal hypertension. Portal hypertension, remember now that, that blood flow is getting obstructed and um, pushed back. So where is it gonna be pushed back to? Well, it's gonna be pushed back into the portal system. Now, we know path of least resistance. Well, the path of least resistance, one of those is the esophagus. esophagus. So the esophagus um, ends up with something called esophageal varices. Esophageal varices, I like to call them esophageal hemorrhoids because that's kind of what they are. Um, but they're very fragile and they can easily bleed. And so a lot of times we don't even know these patients have esophageal varices until they burst and they come in and they're bleeding. So that is the most common clinical manifestation of portal hypertension. The other one, of course, is thrombocytopenia, particularly decreased platelet count, and that's because the manifestations of the congestion in the spleen. So we call it congestive splenomegaly. And this, of course, is going to contribute to that increased bleeding tendency. These esophageal varices are already very fragile, and so it turns into the perfect storm and causes them to bleed. Another manifestation of cirrhosis or dysfunctional liver is something called hepatic encephalopathy. So remember the Kupfer cells in the liver are pretty important, right? They help detoxify things, they kill off extra bacteria, viruses, they're, they're pretty important in that liver for detoxification. But when there's liver dysfunction, the collateral vessels, what happens is it begins to shunt blood away and it's very haphazard how the blood actually is even getting through that liver, which means the blood doesn't have a lot of time to interact with those wonderful little Kupfer cells, right? So what ends up happening is some of these harmful substances, in particular, ammonia. And so ammonia builds up and it really has a, an effect on the central nervous system. So these patients come in very confused and so we can draw an ammonia level. A lot of times the, the intensity of confusion doesn't always match how high the ammonia is. It's very individualized. Um, but what we can do is we can initiate treatment and watch the ammonia level go down. A lot of times you don't even have to do that. You can tell that the patient becomes much clearer in thought, no longer confused. So you don't always need those lab values. All right, so let's talk about acute pancreatitis and we're gonna finish up part one here. Then I'll go ahead and we're gonna, um, then you can go ahead and listen to the part two. But acute pancreatitis, clinical manifestations, epigastric or mid-abdominal pain is usually a very common sign, very common symptom. So fever and leukocytic, Psychosis accompany the inflammatory response. 
So some of the electrolyte imbalances, we think of hypocalcemia. There's a lot of theories about this. We call it saponification of um, the fat. And for some reason, that's just a fancy way. Your book says it much easier. It's for whatever reason, the calcium becomes sequestered in the fat. Um, not sure why that happens, but with pancreatitis, we definitely want to draw those calcium levels. And so some of the clinical manifestations will be a patient may show signs of muscle tetany. Remember the signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia? See how all this just keeps coming back. Isn't it wonderful? Anyway, they also have that feeling of numbness and tingling. So the problem with acute pancreatitis, uh, sometimes they're admitted to the floor or to the unit and you're thinking, well, what the heck, they look fine. But they can go uh, deteriorate very, very quickly. And so they have to be monitored. One of the earliest signs we know of deterioration related to sepsis, which can certainly occur with acute pancreatitis, and even worse, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which we're going to focus on here in part two. But those are the two things we really watch for with acute pancreatitis. And one of the earliest, earliest signs that you know these patients may be deteriorating is that increase in respiration, tachypnea, because we know that hypoxemia may be taking place, but also because of that potential for metabolic acidosis. And you're thinking, well, why metabolic acidosis? Well, remember, if there's in a state of lack of oxygen and perfusion going on in the body, once again, lactic acid is going to start pouring out. So, you know, we think of vital signs as being a very mundane task. But wow, it can really, really give us a heads up as to a change in that patient's status. All right, so thank you very much. Please contact me if you have any questions. And now we're going to move on to part two.